you. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Holy Spirit has filled this atmosphere. His presence is here. And so by the power of the Holy Spirit, I say this to you, grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today we're actually concluding a series that we've been in for a while now titled, Things Jesus Never Says. And one thing that Jesus never says is that you're on your own, right? Nowhere in the scriptures will you find that Jesus says that. But today, I just want to say that I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time trying to convince you of this or, or, or show you in the scriptures that Jesus doesn't say this because the truth is, I think most of you already know this. Right? Most of us can have it memorized at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, the very last words of Jesus in that Gospel. He says, I will what? Be with you always. I will will be with you always. So today, I really don't want to spend a whole lot of time trying to prove to you that Jesus actually says this, because I know you already know it. Instead, what I want to talk about is just what does it mean that the Holy Spirit is with us and that the Holy Spirit is within us? And in fact, I don't just want us to talk about it. In fact, I want you to see it for yourselves, to see it in your own lives, and to see it in the life of the Apostle Peter on this day of Pentecost. Because as we celebrate Pentecost today, truly what I want for each and every one of you here is I want you to be renewed by the Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters in Christ, as we begin, why don't we start with a word of prayer? So let us pray. Most good and gracious God, Lord, uh, we thank you so much for sending us your Son, our Savior, into this world who who through his death grants us forgiveness of sins and and through his resurrection gives us life and salvation. And Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you promise and in fact you have sent us your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you come to us through, through the water and the word like we just witnessed creating in us faith and and always being with us and within us, giving us peace and mercy and grace and love and life. All this we ask and pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Amen. So uh, I have a uh, visual for everyone today, and uh, thank you for putting it up on the screen. Now, I will say, I'm sorry, it's not an, of an, ad, out, a, uh, an adult beverage, right? You already got some of those adult beverage commercials a few weeks ago. Now, this, this visual is a little bit different. By the way, does anybody actually know what this is? I'm curious. Anybody else that wasn't here for one of the other sermons? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is it? It, it, you're right, it does make music. Do you, do you know what the official term of it is? Anybody? If, if you're joining us online, if you know what it is, type it in the chat. So it's called a glass harp. To be honest with you, I didn't always know that. <laughs> but uh, what I want you to do if you've never, and now actually, has anybody ever heard a glass harp before? Right? I see some people shaking their heads. No, well, if you haven't heard a glass harp, what I want you to do is wait until after service, not right now, after service, type it into YouTube, and watch this, because it really isn't just a sight to see, it is a sound to listen to. Now, I remember the first time that I actually got to see a glass harp. It was, uh, surprisingly, it was on a street corner in Austin, Texas. I grew up in the Austin area, and, and the city of Austin is known for having all these different live music venues, and it's known for having all sorts of, of live street performers. And of course, one day, you know, I kind of see this odd thing on a street corner, and so I went closer to inspect just what in the world was going on. And, and as I got closer, I noticed that this guy, he had this table set up on the corner, and he had all these rows of glasses, and they were different shapes and, and different sizes. And in each of these glasses, they were filled with different amounts of water. But what really astonished me is I just watched him as he would dip his finger in water, And he would touch it to the lips of those glasses. And and basically what he would do is he would make these glasses sing. And what baffled me is is, is when I watched with my eyes, I'd see his hand go here and here and here. And it just looked like there was no rhyme or reason to what he was doing. But with my ears, 
I could hear it. You see, he was taking this sound from this glass and and that sound from that glass, and he was joining them all together into this grand symphony. And uh, at one point, I noticed that there's this glass that was like at the very end of the table. And uh, not only did I notice this at the very end, it, it kind of, as an onlooker, it kind of gave me this impression that, that this glass was like out of reach for this guy. And not only was the glass looking like it was out of reach, it appeared to be completely empty, right? No water in it at all. So at this point, maybe you're thinking the same thing that I was thinking then. How in the world is this guy going to make that glass sing? He dipped his finger in water and he reached out and he touched the lip of that glass and it let out the, this, this high, probably the most beautiful note in his whole song. It was amazing. Today, I'd like you to keep this image of a glass heart both, both in the back and the forefront of your mind as you listen to the message. And as we turn now to the Apostle Peter in this day of Pentecost, Because what we see here in Acts chapter 2 is we we see the Holy Spirit with the apostles, right? Filling the very atmosphere and space that they are in. Much like when, when God's Spirit filled the tent and tabernacle in the Old Testament back in Exodus. How he was with them in a pillar of cloud by day and a, and a pillar of fire by night. And, and like that pillar of fire, the Holy Spirit comes within the apostles and gives them tongues of fire. And so here on this, on this great day of Pentecost, we see the Spirit's presence affect not only the disciples opening their mouths to speak the gospel, we also see the Spirit reaching out to everyone in the apostles' proximity, opening their ears to hear this good news in their own native language. And then we get to verse 14 in Acts chapter 2, and it's one of my favorite verses. It simply says, Peter stood up among the eleven and lifted up his voice. Peter preaches his very first sermon. Now, as a pastor, I'll have to admit, right, that Peter's first sermon goes a lot better than my first sermon certainly did. After hearing Peter's first sermon, I actually went back, looked on my computer, and found the very first sermon that I wrote, and I read through it, and i got to tell you, the first thought that came to my mind was, only God can work through this. (laughs) And I thank you, Lord, that, that you work through this mess of my words, and I thank you that I only had to give that sermon once on Advent. (laughs) Today we get to hear Peter's uh, very first sermon on Pentecost, and I don't, I don't know if this ever happens for you, but I notice it happens to me, especially when I come across passages or read passages very often. Like here on Pentecost, every year we read and listen to the same passages of Scripture. And what happens for me, and maybe this happens for you, sometimes you, know, you hear it so much that you kind of start glancing over things, like simple things that are actually really significant and really important. Well, I found myself kind of of, of doing that here. You know, I I, I was glancing over the reality that this is Peter's first sermon, and the fact that Peter can preach at all is itself absolutely amazing. Now, I think part of the reason this happens is that, especially when it comes to Peter, right, in the Gospels, we're kind of used to hearing Peter talk, aren't we? So it's not that surprising that Peter has something to say here in Acts. Because when we go back and you look at the life of Peter and the actions of Peter all throughout the Gospels, right? Peter is the one disciple who always seems to have something to say. Right? It's, it's kind of like this. Of all the disciples, Peter is the one disciple who is never at a loss for words. Right? Think back to Luke chapter 9 when they're, when they're on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is having this holy conversation with Moses and Elijah. And and James and John are there, and and they are sitting there in this holy silence, just caught up in the wonder of what's happening, but not Peter, no. 
Now, Peter actually butts in on this conversation. He interrupts Jesus, and he says, Lord, it is good that we are here. I want to build some booths, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And the writer of the Gospel of Luke, whose name is Luke, he also wrote Acts, by the way, you can kind of see him shaking his head when he writes the next verse and he says, Peter didn't know what he was saying. Up on the mountain, Peter isn't at a loss for words. Out on the sea, Peter isn't at a loss for words. You remember that when, when Peter is in that boat with the other disciples and they're in the midst of this great storm in the middle of the night and they're all terrified, not just because of the storm, but suddenly they see what appears to be a ghost coming to them from out on the water and they are stricken with fear. And 11 of the disciples, right, they, they stand there in the boat in this holy silence caught up in the wonder of what's going on or, or maybe just caught up in of what's going on. But not Peter. Peter has something to say. What Peter does is he, he reaches down deep and he, and he pulls out what he thinks is a word of courage. And he says, Lord, if it really is you, because he really doesn't think it is, but if it really is you, Lord, then, then why don't you command me to come to you on the water? And of course, we all know how that story goes, don't we? Up on the mountain, out on the sea, Peter is never at a loss for words. Not even on the night when Jesus was betrayed. Shortly after receiving the very first communion of our Lord, what does Peter say to Jesus while he is with him? Although they all fall away, Lord, not me, Peter says. I will follow you to prison and to death. But you and I know what Scripture tells us actually happened. A few hours later, Jesus is imprisoned. And there Peter stands in the courtyard and somebody comes up to him and asks him, Do you know Jesus? And Peter says what? No. And every time he says those words, I do not know that man, Jesus, it's like he was just emptying himself of every last drop of Jesus until there was nothing left. See, he was a, a shell of a disciple, an empty glass, if you ever saw one. And that's what makes what's happening here in Acts chapter 2 so incredible that Peter can preach his first sermon. Because you see, it's not about the glass. It's not about how full or how empty you are. It is all about the one who can dip his finger in water and touch it to a glass and make that glass sing. And that's what Jesus is doing Right, risen and ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he sends forth his Spirit at Pentecost. And through the Spirit, Jesus is, is he's reaching out and he is just touching all sorts of different glasses. Right? He, he's touching on Old Testament poets and, and prophets and psalms. He's, he's touching on fishermen and making them speak in, in tongues that they never knew. He takes this sound from this prophet and that sound from that apostle. And he joins them all together into this great song of salvation. And there we see it in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, that, uh, that empty glass at the end of the table that seems like it's almost out of reach. And yet through the Spirit, Jesus takes his finger and he, and he puts it to the lip of that glass and he makes Peter sing. And the song that he sings, it is breathtaking. I mean, yes, it begins with a word of law. Right? Peter says in his sermon, you killed Jesus, Peter says. But in the next stanza, what the, the, the gospel that he speaks, it is so amazing and unexpected. He says, but God raised him up, this Jesus, whom you crucified, and he has made him Lord of all creation. 
and everyone, everyone listening, everyone in the proximity is hearing and being swept up in the song of salvation. You get to the very end of Acts chapter 2 and it tells us that people repent and are saved. 3,000 new baptized believers. You see, what God started at Pentecost, He is still doing to this very day through the water and word of holy baptism that He just witnessed. Through the, through the bread and the wine that we will later receive in this very sermon, God is sending forth His Spirit. And through His Spirit, He is reaching out and He's playing this, this glass harp that we call the church. And He's causing you and I, and He's causing us Christians to, to join in this, in this song of salvation. You see, by grace, God in Christ can make any empty vessel sing. And so today, as we celebrate Pentecost, I want you to be renewed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who is with you and who is within you. Because the truth is, over this past year, especially that we have been in this COVID-19 crisis, there has been a lot that has just been draining on us, right? It has been draining on us so much so that, that many of us have either felt this way or maybe you're feeling this way now. You feel completely empty, right? Maybe it's from all the, the restrictions that we've been having to deal with, the isolation from the social distancing. Maybe it's all the stuff that you have going on at work that's just been draining everything out of you. Or maybe, maybe even for some of you parents and grandparents out there, right? You love your children, but it can be draining. And some days, some days you wake up in the morning as a parent or as a grandparent and you just feel completely empty. Or maybe you're a caregiver for a loved one. Maybe it's your own spouse whom you have to wait on 24-7, and as much as you love her or you love him, it takes everything out of you. And some days you wake up and you feel completely empty. Look, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what all you've been going through. I don't know what you're currently going through, but what I do know is this, is that, that you are not on your own. God's Spirit is with you, and God's Spirit is within you. So when you feel empty, when the hardships of this life are just draining everything out of you, come to this place and listen to God's message. Because what God the Father has done is, is He has taken this Jesus whom we crucified and He has raised Him and exalted Him and made Him Lord and Christ over all things. And this Jesus, this Jesus who rules and reigns over all of creation, He has sent forth His Spirit in you. God is with you and God is in you help you, to comfort you, to fill you with his peace, and to fill you with strength, not just for this life, but for life everlasting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.